Good evening, everybody. Hello, everyone. My name is Dustin Duran. I'm a director of security research. Um, my team is responsible for understanding attackers, what they do, how they do it, and then building the protections that you will see that we'll talk about today. And I have to say, this is one of my absolute favorite topics to discuss because it is a direct benefit from my team to yours. Um, together with me today is Kim, director of marketing. Kim, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. And um, just to kick us off, don't be worried because there's marketing in my content. I promise you, we have maybe three slides that you would consider marketing. And then we're really going to dive into the tech and look at some of the attacks and what we're doing about it. So um, just to kind of um, lay out what are some of the challenges that we're seeing for SOC teams, um, I'm going to start talking about the landscape that we have a little bit um, and how XDR fits in there to help with some of these challenges. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we consider to be Microsoft Defender XDR superpower, and that's automatic attack disruption. And then we're really going to dive into three case studies um, and walk you through kind of the attack patterns that we've seen and how attack disruption um, helps with those. And then, um, because this is Ignite, this is a big moment for us in the year, we're going to talk a little bit about what's new, what, are we what did we just announce in the previous session through Rob, um, and what's next. Security is hard. Um, you in the room know this. Um, and so now more than ever, there's a lot of pressure on the SOC. Um, some of the reasons for this is really grounded in the exponential growth that we're seeing in frequency and speed and in, is that okay? So probably, Mike. Um, and the targeting of threats. Our research team, Dustin and his team, um, year over year saw an increase of over 130% in ransomware alone. Now, there are, um, there's ransomware as a service, which is obviously one of the factors influencing that, but it's just becoming more and more challenging for security teams. Um, and in talking to customers and security leaders and security practitioners, what we're hearing as a constant is the sheer amount of tools they're using. Um, for this feature, for this capability. And so that makes it really hard to understand the big picture because you have one tool for every single feature you could wish for on the planet. And then that makes it really hard to kind of understand end to end, where did the attack start? How did it move um, to eventually, you know, cause compromise your organization. And ultimately that leads to alert fatigue, sock burnout, security leaders are telling us they are already worried about the staff shortage and security and with how attacks are progressing and the alerts that we're seeing, it's just gonna get worse. And so a huge part of this is really the sophistication and complexity of attacks that we're seeing. Ransomware, business email compromise, data exfiltration. It's not just about you know, starting at the endpoint, ending at the endpoint, starting with identity, ending with identity. Let's take ransomware, for example. It starts with, for example, a phishing email um, to get that initial access, and then it's all about you know, creating a foothold in the organization and moving laterally before eventually encrypting a device to then extort a ransom. And so it's really important to kind of understand the attack flow end to end to really know, well, what is compromised in my organization? How did they get um, to ultimately execute the attack? And so that's really where XDR comes in. Microsoft Defender XDR is our unified security operations tool at Microsoft where we bring together um, a set of security solutions natively into a single XDR. And so for Microsoft, natively, we have full security solutions for on-prem and cloud identities, for endpoints and IoT devices, email and team security, SaaS apps, so that's your CASB, right? All of the apps in your organization, SaaS apps that you want to secure. Data, here you should think about data loss, understanding user risk as part of the incident experience. And then lastly, and that was just announced in the previous session, now we also have the, all of the signal and alerts from Defender for Cloud, which is our cloud native application platform for cloud workloads integrated into one experience. So if you're using the Defender stack, that means they just communicate with one another. There's no manual integration, there's nothing you need to do, they just share signal and work as one. And so, of course, XDR implies detection and response, but these are complete security solutions, right? We're not just talking about EDR, we're talking about the complete EPP, for example, in the case of Endpoint. And so it goes across the entire life cycle from prevention to help you improve your security posture to obviously protecting where we can, stopping the attacker from getting in in the first place, and then, of course, taking care of the detection and response. 
And so before I hand over, um, one thing, um, we get a lot of questions from customers, okay, but like, tell me how that is different from my SIM or my SOAR, where I can you know, also correlate signals from all these different um, solutions. And that's really where our superpower comes in. And this is something that only Microsoft has built in into its XDR um, and working, and that's automatic attack disruption. Um, and Dustin's now gonna talk to you all about how that works. Thank you, Kim. So in the modern attack landscape, detection alone, it's not enough, right? It's not gonna solve the problem. Because we know that attackers, they're evolving, they're innovating, but they're also automating, right? They're gonna make their attacks more repeatable, they're gonna shorten the time it takes for them to achieve their objectives, they're gonna to try to stay more silent. If the security of the organization depends only on human response, we will fail. They will beat us. Enter attack disruption. So this is our out-of-the-box capability designed to stop sophisticated attacks um, like human operated ransomware, business email compromise, adversary in the middle MFA bypass. Um, it is designed to identify the intention behind these attacks and stop them. This is not some you know, static playbook running in the background. This is not just a sequence of steps that says if then else do this. This is combining all those surfaces, all those signals that Kim just spoke about to actually understand and analyze the intention behind the attacks and really differentiate those true positives with 99% certainty to say this is real and then go and remove the footholds that the attacker has to have in order to continue and achieve their outcomes. Things like removing compromised credentials. Don't have compromised credentials, you lose that foothold. Things like removing code execution on a device. If I have remote code execution on a device and I take that away, I have taken away that attacker foothold. So the goal is to automatically at machine speed come in and remove these footholds to stop and slow that attacker, give the SOC more time to respond, limit the damage to the organization all automatically. Okay? So this works ahead of and in concert with the SOC. So as we'll see today, as Kim will take us through at some point, um, we do want to keep that SOC in control. So there is configuration options that they can do to control the identities or the machines that are in play. However, there is nothing to turn on. There is nothing to configure. It works just straight out of the box. And the reason for that is because speed matters. It matters. As Rob talked about in the previous session, this is a game of minutes to seconds in many cases. And so we needed the ability where if we are gonna disrupt at machine speed, the minute we can recognize the intent of that as a human operated ransomware attack, three minutes to shut it down. Right? Significantly faster in most cases than a human could respond in that time. And that equates to real protection. The goal, especially in a human operated ransomware attack, is to limit the machines that get ransom, limit the data that gets encrypted, limit the data that gets exfiltrated out of that environment. And we find that we're able to save 94% of those machines. Um, and that happens automatically. And this equates to real numbers. These are the hundreds of machines behind here across thousands of customers. Um, in critical environments, like a <laughs> cancer medical lab, that customer cannot afford the downtime that would come with a human-operated ransomware attack. You know, here we are, saving dozens of machines. Again, in this uh, second case, you know, hundreds of machines basically being, being saved. And I will tell you, you know, as a researcher, we do talk to our red teams, um, and uh, they do find this very frustrating. You know? And that's a good test of how well it's working when they come to me and they say, this is really difficult to contend against. It lets us know that we're doing something right. So let's dive in a little bit. Let's take a, let's take a deeper look. So as defenders out there, I'm sure for most of you, this is a very familiar table. Uh, minor attack framework is one of the, the de facto sources to understand how attackers do what they do. And it is an invaluable resource to us as defenders. It is critical that we understand how these attacks work. But I argue there is something super critical missing from this slide. And that is how these techniques connect with each other to flow from one step to the next in the kill chain. Because as defenders, if we are thinking in this list form, if we are thinking in columns in a spreadsheet, we are not thinking like attackers because attackers are thinking in graphs. 
They're thinking in the objectives that they need to achieve and working back from those objectives to say, to get to step D, I need to do ABC first. And this is how I'm going to do it. So this is another place where if as defenders, we do not shift our thinking to think end to end, to think in that graph form, we are putting ourselves in a disadvantage. And that's exactly how this works behind the scenes. And that's exactly how my research team approaches these kind of problems to build this technology. So let's take a look at this. In a human operated ransomware attack, let's start at the high level. Because while the techniques may differ in each one of these steps, there are key invariants at every step here that have to happen, one way or another, via one technique or another. An attacker has to work through these sequence of steps to achieve their objective. And there will be invariants in understanding not only what are those invariants you need to find, but how they connect with themselves gives us an edge as a defender to recognize the intention and then go shut it down automatically. So let's take a look at this. So some key invariants in here. As an attacker, I need to gain a foothold in your environment. That could be compromised credentials. That could be remote code execution on one of your devices. But I must obtain a beachhead. I need to get into that environment somehow. And then usually, I need to improve my position within that organization. So it follows a sequence of steps. We're going to take a look at credential theft. We're going to take a look at reconnaissance. We're going to take a look at lateral movement. These are all movements that I will have to do to better improve my positioning within the organization because I want to have maximum impact. I want to encrypt either the most sensitive files or as many files as I can get to. I want to exfiltrate those so I can double ransom you. But I need to achieve these steps first. And connecting these dots is what clues us in to what's actually happening within this organization. And by connecting those dots, we can understand the intention. And of course, we can go do something about it automatically. So let's take it down a level. Let's look at a real attack. Let's look at real details of how this might work. So now we'll look at the actual technique level. In this particular case, typically what the attacker wanted to do, play it out what the intention was, establish a beachhead. In this particular case, the attacker established a beachhead by gaining code execution on a non-managed device. This is a device where Microsoft Defender for Endpoint was not running. From here, they wanted to improve their positioning within the organization. They were able to hover some credentials off of that initial beachhead and then move laterally over RDP to another machine, in this case we call it machine A, in order to bring their tool set with them, again, harvest some credentials, do some reconnaissance, going to spread that payload far and wide so I can ultimately delete shadow copies, makes restoration hard, and then of course go and actually do the encryption. But in this case, with automatic attack disruption, we were able to see that this session, this RDP session, and the work that's happening over this RDP session appears as a hands-on keyboard attack. This appears malicious. So automatic actions taken to disable the account that's being used to move laterally, and then actually terminate the RDP session. So we shut that down. But it's a cat and mouse game sometimes. So the attacker says, well, I still want to achieve my objective, so I'm going to try something different. Okay, I was not able to improve my position within the organization, so I'm going to operate from what I got. So from this position point, I'm going to attempt to spread my payload. Again, I'm going to try to get it out there via MSMB, see if I can execute that using PS exec. Again, perform the same sequence of steps. Right? Once again, I want to delete those shadow copies. I want to encrypt those files. Two things happen now. The first one is, once again, we detect that that lateral movement's being done via compromised credentials, right? via these harvested credentials, disable those accounts. But now we have enough evidence to say we know where this is originating from. Because it's very important to determine root cause or initial entry point, initial beachhead. And we're able to say, ah, we think that's the machine. There it is. We found it. And we can contain that non-managed device. And what that means is, is every machine in your enterprise running Microsoft Defender for Endpoint will no longer talk to that machine. So even though that it was unmanaged, we have now uh, contained it from the rest of the organization. Again, the attacker has lost their advantage. They've lost their capability. They've lost their foothold. No ransom occurred. No encryption occurred. So let's take a look at this from the defender point of view. So if we come into the portal, a couple key things I want to be able to point out. So the first one is, is that we are automatically connecting those dots. You see down the left-hand side there, the key is, is connecting the alerts and signal to tell an end-to-end -end attack story. It is connecting those individual techniques across that graph of activity and automatically combining that together. That's really, really critical for us because it is via that connectivity that we can understand the intention behind this attack, which is what you see here highlighted in red on the right-hand side. We have correctly identified that this is a ransomware attack. 
And of course, we're able to come in and apply our automatic attack disruption. As I mentioned during the attack, we correctly identified that the RDP session that was in progress was malicious. That was a lateral movement being performed by the attacker to improve their positioning in the organization. They're going to use that as a staging point to reach far and wide within that organization. We have detected that. We understand the machine that is happening to, as well as the user account that is being used for that RDP session. So the Aaron account has been harvested. This is a compromised account at this point. And we're able to recognize sort of the intention behind this. So at this point, we're able to say, this, this looks like hands-on keyboard, right? It's RDP session, hands-on basically effectively the device. We detect that, and now we spring to action. So we're able to come in, and we first we uh, contain the user account, which will terminate active RDP sessions via that account. So we've, we've killed those session tokens. We've turn, terminated the RDP session. As you can see, we've done it in as little as 25 seconds. Again, those seconds matter. And then we come through and we disable that account as well. Because we know that account's been compromised, we don't want to, that to be used to again move laterally somebody else or somewhere else. Let's shut that down. Again, bringing you back to the actual flow, the attacker decides to take a different route, like an expert game of jujitsu here. We're going to respond in time. We're going to counter. So here we see that in the second flow, now it really looks like we're in progress of a ransomware attack, human-operated ransomware attack. So once again, we're able to recognize, here you see on the left-hand side, that this is exhibiting ransomware-like behavior. On the right-hand side, we identify not only the machines at play and the account that has been harvested, this is the aerial account this time, but now we have enough evidence to say, ah, this unmanaged device is the root. This is the beachhead. So here we come in. Once again, we disable the compromise account. So we've disabled Ariel now at this point. Again, we recognize the intention behind this. So now we can come in and contain this, advice, uh, this device. And again, it's an unmanaged device. We're in a position to say, if you're running Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, do not talk to this device. No files have been encrypted or ransomed. And you can see here in this view, the accounts that have been harvested have been disabled automatically, allowing the SOC to come in investigate and choose when they'd like to bring these accounts back online. I'd like to turn it over to Kim now. All take right. a look at business email compromise. OK, so we just had a look at ransomware. Um, now let's talk about cloud-based attacks, like business email compromise. Now, one of the big differences with cloud-based attacks is that the goal is typically financial fraud. So unlike with a ransomware campaign, what I'm not trying to do is actually achieve code execution on the device on your network. Instead, I'm really trying to get access to credentials and abuse them within your network. And so if we kind of go you know, to the theory here again of how do we typically see these um, attacks play out, um, it all really starts with, I need valid credentials to the organization. And so attackers use a set of different techniques, for example, a phishing email, um, credential stuffing, or just buying them off of the dark web. And if no one said it to you today, this is your cue to go turn on MFA if you haven't, right? Like, let's start there. Um, and so let's say they've got valid credentials, right? Then they go and log in to your environment. And so once they have access, um, you know, they go and then um, try to collect information across your inbox, across you know, SharePoint, for example, to understand financial flows in the organization, payroll in the, inf in the organization. This is going to be really important for when they're going to send an email um, to one of the finance departments to make it look authentic and for the content to be authentic. So um, that collection of information is super important. Now, of course, before they do anything, um, they also want to make sure that they don't get found out um, by the end user that's already compromised through anything that looks off within their inbox. And so what we typically see here in um, the defense evasion is under four is um, the creation of inbox rules, right? And that can be based on certain subject lines or certain keywords that they plan on using um, to essentially stay under the radar um, when they're doing that. And then, um, what happens is essentially an email is sent out requesting payment or requesting payroll information to the finance department. And if they're successful, payment is rendered and then um, financial loss occurs in the organization. That's the theory. Now, 
Let's take another look at a um, BEC campaign that we saw play out um, in a customer environment and how we kind of now handle that with attack disruption. So the first thing I want to point to you, uh, point out is as well that this happened within a matter of hours, right? Not in a matter of days, even though there was a lot of um, different steps going on. Um, and what happened here essentially in this attack is that the combination of signals from three of our Defender products, Defender for Office 365, which is essentially our email security solution, Defender for Cloud Apps, our SaaS security or CASB solution, and Entra ID identity protection, um, helped us identify that an active business email compromise campaign was going on in the environment. And so then that's where attack disruption kicks in. What the SOC sees is an alert for a suspicious sequence of events possibly related to a BC fraud attempt. Um, but the critical action that was actually taken is one, we're disabling the compromised account, ultimately shutting out the attacker, and then also removing the inbox rule, so reverting it um, because we saw that being created, and quarantining the attacker sent email so that the finance department ideally doesn't even see it and can't act on it. And so in this case, um, no payment was ultimately rendered and we saved the um, customer from any form of financial loss. Now when these attacks happen, our research team um, analyzes them really closely and they actually started seeing a trend where um, attackers started using further kind of to the left in the very beginning, um, adversary in the middle attacks. And what that essentially means is they're placing a proxy server between the user and the website that they're trying to access to intercept the password and intercept um, the active session cookie. So this is not a vulnerability in MFA because they're essentially intercepting the active session um, and then using that to ultimately gain that initial access. And so we thought let's also build attack disruption for that exact scenario. And so when an attacker now comes in and uses adversary in the middle attacks, um, what Microsoft Defender XDR does here, same thing. We disable that compromised user account, except we're able to do it even earlier in the attack chain because we see the suspicious behavior happen really early. And so they essentially never have the chance to actually go sift through inbox, create that inbox rule, um, because we're shutting the attacker out and disabling that user account way earlier. And so let's jump back into the actual Microsoft Defender portal. This is what you would be looking at. Um, on the right hand side, one, we can see kind of that um, positive identification of a BEC business email compromise financial fraud attack. And something I also want to point out are kind of the tags that are associated with every incident that we create, right? Those, you can filter for those tags and we'll take a look at that in a second as well. But BEC fraud, credential fish and attack disruption. You see any of those tags in one of your incidents in your incident queue, you're going to want to take a closer look and take a closer look fast. Um, and so here we can see that everything started ultimately by um, with a click on a suspicious URL and that our user Li G and the device Park City Win 10 d were essentially the compromised um, assets in this case. Now then what followed was ultimately a suspicious inbox rule creation. And we can see here that the attacker was also trying to obfuscate their location and their device. They were using a Tor IP address, as we can see kind of in the middle. I don't have that highlighted here on the screen. Um, and so I'm kind of following the sequence of events now. Um, and then impacted assets um, here again. And so the final alert I wanna point out, BEC financial fraud attack, um, that was classified accurately here and then ultimately what happened and here's where we see dis attack disruption taking action. Um, I, comp I disabled the compromised user um, based on an account of financial fraud. And the way we're able to really you know, act on that level of 99% um, confidence is because of the combination of the signals of the different solutions essentially that are talking and communicating with each other, right? Because we are taking disruptive, you know, cue on the name, action within your environment, so we better be confident. And then here, just if you kind of at the top move to the assets tab, um, we can see exactly again, hey, which are the users that are currently disabled in my environment um, to kind of understand um, that better. And Dustin, you want to talk a little bit about AITM now? 
So as Kim mentioned, uh, my team is responsible for studying these attacks in the wild. Um, and we learn a lot when we do this. And one of the things that we noticed is MFA did exactly what it was supposed to. It A, prevents a lot of attacks, and B, forced attackers to have to contend with MFA. It makes it more expensive for them to attempt to work around it. It makes it more complex for them to have to do so. But it does something else that's very important. It gives us a lot more signal when they're attempting to bypass it. So for us, the goal is to move as far left in those attack kill chains as you can see for attack disruption. The earlier we can stop it, the less there is to clean up, the less potential risk to the organization. And this is one of those signals that is very strong. Um, through our cloud identity visibility, um, we can see the sequence of steps that the attacker is going to need to do to not only get those credentials, but also get that valid session cookie. And as a result, we can, once again, identify that this is taking place, understand the intention behind those sequence of actions, which is, I am trying to defeat MFA, identify it, and of course, shut it down. And so once again, you see kind of same pattern here. Automatic attack disruption kicks in automatically to disable the account. But I love this scenario because the attacker had no control over that account. Like, in the 53 seconds it took to identify that it shut that down, they could do nothing with the account. It served no benefit to them. They're back at square one. Um, so once again, you see our ability to come in and do this on behalf of the SOC team is very, very powerful because at this point, the attacker never gained any access to an inbox, was never able to do any recon, never learned virtually anything about that environment. We took that foothold away. Back to Kim for the fundamentals. Right. So I think we tried to kind of talk you through as well how the actions we take is always based on a combination of signals. It's never a you know single um, alert or a single like signal that we see to then take such a disruptive action within the environment. We really want to achieve that 99% level of confidence when we take action, and that's through the combination of you know signals from across the defender portfolio. Um, I will say that the customers who are using this, Dustin earlier mentioned, we've made some red teams really upset and we're really happy about that um, because it works and it is so effective. And this is probably one of the first, if not only, automations in security where customers have actually come to us and said, can you do more? Can you do more for more scenarios? Now, at the same time, I know that we get questions for, but how can I exclude my CEO? When they get disabled, I'd love to not lose my job. Now, that's a maybe bigger question around whether that's the right question to ask, right? Because if we can guarantee that high confidence, if they're targeted, you want that account. Shout out. Nonetheless, we do want to give you controls. We want to, you know, obviously, you're always in control of ultimately the remediation after um, the attack, uh, attack has happened and bringing it back into a healthy state. But, um, there's also a couple things of like how you can really control attack disruption. First thing I want to start with though is your incident queue. Um, if you're already using Defender, you're super familiar with this. And so one of the ways to really easily look for, hey, where did attack disruption act in my environment is to go filter for the tag attack disruption. Straightforward, right? And so that would give you an overview of all of the incidents where the system ultimately took automatic action for you. Here's one example, and then if you click on it, we saw a lot of the incident experiences earlier. That's ultimately where it would take you. Now, if you are adamant on excluding certain users or user groups in your environment from attack disruption, you can do that. And so if in the Defender portal, you ultimately go to the settings menu, um, identities first, um, go into the identity settings menu, and then here you can ultimately choose to um, in the menu bar under automated response actions, you can choose to exclude users if you want to. And so here you can, um, yeah. And then the second um, area where you can do that is for devices because we showed you, hey, we take automatic action on you know, users, disabling users, but also the same thing on containing devices, making them not able to connect or communicate on the network, um, even if they're unmanaged. And so you do that um, in the endpoint settings, um, relatively straightforward, and you can kind of see that there are different levels of remediation available. So if you do want to create a rule here for certain device groups that you have in your environment, um, full remediate threats automatically, relatively straightforward. That's where we do do the attack disruption. 
um, actions that we showed you earlier, but there are different levels of control that you have over the automation that is taken. So while we are very confident in the actions that we are taking in these advanced scenarios, we also do want to give you control and that's um, how we do that. Okay, um, final part. What's available today? What's new? What did we just announce? So Dustin and I just walked you through um, three scenarios in depth. That's human operated ransomware, an attack disruption, business email compromise, and adversary in the middle. Now, if you um, were in the session before this that Rob Leffords um, gave and talked to you about the Unified Security Operations Platform, if you weren't, please go back and watch it. Um, what we announced today is that we are unifying our SIM and XDR platforms. And as a benefit of what we're doing here is that we're now able to actually extend attack disruption into third-party apps. And the first scenario where we're doing that is for SAP um, apps if they are connected to Microsoft Sentinel. So what that essentially means is before, well, before we were able to act on devices that were managed by Defender for Endpoint, and try IDs ultimately, and um, with this extension we're saying, hey, we can actually disable the SAP account itself. Of course, if there's an associated entry ID, we will disable that as well, but we can do it right at the SAP level. And so that's kind of the next iteration um, of where we're taking attack disruption. Now, there's more coming. Um, the way that we're building our roadmap is really grounded in what are the attacks that our customers are most affected by. Um, and so, Unified Security Operations Platform, that's really the news um, that we, the biggest news that we shared today. The second piece though, is also um, that Microsoft Defender for Cloud, so all of our cloud workloads, our CNAP solution, is now natively integrated in Microsoft Defender XDR. And so, big reason for this is of course, because we are seeing attackers now increasingly move from end user assets, which is a lot what we talked about today, into cloud infrastructure, right? Think about um, crypto jacking, um, and so basically compromising the workloads running in your cloud environment. And, you know, as we think about our roadmap of attack disruption, you know, cue here, we obviously want to take into account those new types of attacks um, that we're seeing. So rest is like, we can assure you we're heavily invested in this and more is coming. Um, and then the last piece that I qu quickly want to give a shout out to and um, that maybe you saw a deeper dive earlier is that we now have deception capabilities built into Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. And so I'm personally super excited about this um, because essentially what this means um, is that we're now giving the ability to every Defender for Endpoint customer to um, generate and deploy deception assets, decoys and lures into their environment. Now the coolest thing about that is probably it's AI powered. We just use ML to understand your environment, generate the right decoys and deploy them using the existing infrastructure. So there's no broken process, there's no extra thing you need to do or deploy. Um, it's very straightforward, you just create the role, we do the rest. And here's a ton of resources for you to go learn more, learn more about our announcements today. Um, and with that, thank you so much for staying late. Um, really appreciate it for the people online as well. And um, thank you. <laughs>